So a huge welcome everyone today. Um, it's so great to have so many of you with us. Um, we hope that um, regardless of where you're at in the stage of either um, thinking about applying or perhaps you've already applied to the programme or you may be an offer holder um, or someone who's deferred from last year, um, we hope that you find today useful and informative and hopefully it gives you a bit more information about the faculty um, to help you um, either prepare an application or make a decision um, to join us next year. Um, so my name's Jamie Smith. I'm the Graduate Top Programs Manager. So I head up the LLM um, Programs and Admissions Office at the Faculty of Laws. Um, I'll be hosting today, um, but I do have a number of panelists here with me and we'll go around and just do some introductions um, so that you know who is here to answer your questions today. Um, so we'll start off with Sarah, who's our Program Director. Hello everybody, my name is Sarah Campling. I'm the LLM Program Director. Thanks very much for attending this session. Um, my role is to support the LLM students. So if you decide to come and study with us here at UCL Laws, I will be supporting you along your journey through the LLM. So welcome. Excellent, thanks Sarah. Um, next up we have Jonathan Chan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan. I'm a lecturer in law here. I teach corporate governance, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and my research and teaching interests are in sort of corporate commercial world. Good to see you all. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, next up, we have Stephen Vaughan, another one of our academic staff members. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen. I'm the vice dean of the faculty uh, and professor of law and professional ethics. I teach mainly environmental law, uh, and I was a city lawyer for about 10 years uh, before I saw the light and moved into academia. Very nice to see you all today. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and next up, we have Rachel Knowles from the Centre for Access to Justice. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I'm the head of legal practice at the UCL Centre for Access to Justice. Um, I uh, have oversight of our pro bono programmes and activities and run our legal advice clinic out in Stratford. I am a legal aid lawyer by background and um, then also saw the light and fled to academia. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and lastly, we're very lucky today to be joined by one of our current LLM students, um, Pere. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Pere. Um, I'm from Nigeria. I'm currently reading for um, a general LLM. Um, I'm taking um, international commercial litigation as one of my models, um, international commercial arbitration, and also judges and judicial decision making. While my research is actually in corporate finance. So I'm basically here to give you the inside scoop from a student's perspective. Nice to have you all. Thanks, Perry. Um, so we've got um, a bit of an agenda for today's session. We'll have some presentations from a few of our um, uh, presenters today. And then the second half of the session will be a general Q&A um, where we'll answer as many questions as we can live. Um, and of course, if you've got any questions after the session, you can always get in contact with us by email. Um, so just so you know, for later, for the Q&A session, there is a box at the bottom of the screen. Um, one of the buttons you can click on um, says Q&A. Um, that's where you can start to um, put in any of your questions by text that you want us to answer later on. Um, you don't have to wait until um, later in the session to put your questions there. You can start typing them now. Um, and then once we get to that part, we'll go through the questions that have been submitted. Um, but for now, we're going to start um, with a lecture from Jonathan. So I'll just hand over to him. Um, he's got some slides to share as well. Um, and hopefully you find this interesting. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Jamie. Well, again, a warm welcome. I hope you can all see my screen. I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes and give you an idea of what a lecture at UCL might be like. And our topic today is going to be board diversity and corporate governance. Okay. Now, this is something that I cover in my comparative corporate governance course. So if you're interested, I'm hoping to uh, spur further ideas and you can come take the course with me next year. So let's start by thinking, what is corporate governance? OK, does it matter? If it matters, how is diversity related? OK, so when I say corporate governance, what I'm referring to is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. Okay, so if you take a publicly traded corporation, even a private corporation, so large corporation or a small corporation, at the head you have directors, and these directors are responsible for the governance of the company. 
So they're responsible for the decisions that are made. The directors, so the board of directors, the men and women that sit on the board have authority to hire the CEO, to fire the CEO. Uh, they have authority to set the strategy of the company, whether the company wants to build a new factory or expand into an overseas market, okay? And here on the left, I have copy and pasted an image of AstraZeneca's board of directors, okay? So we should all be familiar with AstraZeneca because of the vaccines they've been making. And here's a snapshot of some of the men and the women that sit on their board and this little biography. Now, obviously these individuals are important and they're important, as I said, because they're making decisions about what the company does and they're accountable. They're accountable to the shareholders who are voting them in, okay? So just like in our normal democracy, we have a system of governance that governs who has power, who makes decisions, who is accountable. In corporations, we have similar governance structures that govern who has the power, who is accountable, how should they be kept to account. So if that's what corporate governance is, why don't you ask yourself, does it matter? What do you think? Do you think it matters? Why might it matter? So I wanna start with a sad story. And this is a story about how directors' decisions can have real-world consequences, okay? So Boeing is an American plane manufacturer, okay? It makes the Jumbo 737 MAX jet, which debuted in 2017. Now, unfortunately, tragically, there was a crash in Indonesia in 2018 and a further crash, a second crash, five months later in Ethiopia in March 2019, and 346 people lost their lives, okay? Now, the crash occurred for technical reasons, so there was a faulty sensor in the plane that was causing the plane to dip when it should have gone up, but the point is that something should have been done after the first crash to make sure the second crash didn't happen, okay? There was a failure in the company to ensure its products were safe. And some of the shareholders in Boeing, okay, they argued that actually it was the board of directors who failed to oversee the governance, the production, the safety, the risk management of their planes. And the shareholders brought a lawsuit. They brought a lawsuit in Delaware, which is an American state. And they were claiming that these directors breach their duty to act in the best interest of the company. Okay, so we call this a duty of loyalty. The director is elected by the shareholders, but they need to act for the good of the company. And these shareholders, which included large pension funds, other institutional investors, so people who govern, who are in, in charge of a, of a lot of capital, they said, directors, you have failed in your governance of the company. And we actually think that the second crash was as a result of your failure. So what did the court say? Well, in a judgment that's come out quite recently this year in Delaware, the court, the judge said that Bowen's board of directors, okay, they uh, had a complete failure to establish a reporting system for their airplane safety, okay? They turned a blind eye to red flags, to problems that they should have seen along the way. And in fact, they were so focused on the bottom line, they were so focused on engineering, uh, short-term uh, financial rewards that they had actually overlooked the core of their product, which is safety, right? Which is ensuring people can get on the plane in one destination and land safely in another, okay? So why might corporate governance matter? I'm suggesting it might matter because companies' actions have important real world consequences, okay? So let's take a different turn for a minute and think about how do groups make decisions, okay? Because we've said that the board of directors of Boeing failed to make good decisions about risk management, but how do groups make decisions generally about anything, anything that needs to be made? Well, I wanna start with an experiment. This is a famous experiment that was conducted by Solomon Ash in the early 1950s. Now, I know I can't see you on the screen, but you can still raise your, home, your hand uh, at home where you're watching now. So on the left of the slide, you see a target line, 
Okay, you can all see its length. Then there's a second image of three lines with different lengths. So I want to ask you, which line is most like the target line? Okay, I know you're at home, I can't see you, but if you think it's line A, why don't you raise your hand? Okay, any takers for line B? Why don't you raise your hand at home if you think that's the length? What about line C? Okay, well, I couldn't see you, but I'm guessing most of you would have said, probably all of you would have said line C, because that's the same length. But what happened in this famous experiment? Well, you put eight people in a room and seven of them are actors. And one person is an innocent participant. And seven people go around the room stating which line they think, but they all state the incorrect line. So they all say line A, or they all say line B. And do you know what happens to that eighth person in the room? A third of the time, that eighth person in the room will say, yep, it's line A, yep, it's line B. They will give an answer that they know is incorrect. Why? Well, because seven people before them have just given the answer, and so they think to themselves, either these people must know something I don't know, I don't trust my own opinion because if everyone else thinks it's this other way, I must be incorrect. Or they think to themselves, actually, I just want to fit in. I want to conform to the group. We might call this peer pressure on a daily basis, right? When others are making decisions and you don't think they're right. And so the point is that social psychology tells us that group pressure decision making, group pressure will influence decision making, and in fact, can lead to individuals making decisions they know to be incorrect, okay? And the psychological literature, we would call this groupthink. The idea that even though people individually would say line C, when you put them in a group, they may all say a different thing because of the pressure of the group, okay? So why is this important? Well, it's important because we've said that directors are in charge of corporate decisions, and corporate decisions have real-world consequences. Now, if they have real world consequences, we want these corporate decisions to be as accurate as possible, as informed as possible, as non-biased as possible, okay? So how can we improve decision-making by boards of directors? Well, I would suggest that one way we can do this is through diversity, by having different opinions on the board. So this year, in the UK, the Financial Conduct Authority, which is the financial regulator who makes rules that govern listed companies in the UK, so public companies, big companies, Vodafone, BP. The FCA, so this regulatory agency, is proposing to have rules that would require boards of directors to have to have three things. Firstly, to have to have 40% of directors on the board be women. Secondly, to have one senior position on the board, like the CEO or the CFO, the chief financial officer, be a woman. And thirdly, the suggestion is that one board member needs to be someone from a non-white ethnic background. So these are these three suggestions. Now, in the UK, companies would not have to comply with these because the principle is that companies can explain if they don't feel the rule is appropriate. That's unlike other jurisdictions. So the proposed rule would have these three things, a quota to have women directors, a senior woman director, and a non-white uh, ethnic background director. But a company, if it didn't want to comply, as is UK, is the general principle in UK governance, uh, the company could publish a list of reasons why it doesn't think this is appropriate. Okay, so what do we think about this? Okay, well, one way of thinking about this is asking, what do other jurisdictions do, okay? So I wanna show you a slide, and this compares the UK to other jurisdictions. Now, it's a couple of years old, so the figures are a little bit lower now than what they would be now, but the proportion is roughly the same. So at the top here, you can see how Norway, France, Sweden, those are countries with mandatory quotas. Companies don't have the option not to comply and to give reasons why they don't want to comply, right? Whereas you have the UK that's towards the bottom and then you have the US that's right at the bottom, okay? 
and new US rules have been proposed this year, a lot is changing. But why is important? Well, as I mentioned, if we're thinking about making good decisions, one way to do so is to make sure that instead of having a dynamic of group think on the board where everyone sees the problem in the same way, everyone thinks about the problem in the same way, everyone responds to the problem in the same way, we have different perspectives on the board. Now, I wanna end with a couple questions. Firstly, do you think companies should be able to choose for themselves what characteristics they need in their directors. So a company might say, well, this is an interesting proposal, but actually in our cultural background, uh, we're not a UK based company. We're traded on a UK stock exchange, but we're from another part of the world where different social norms apply. We don't think this should apply to us. What do you think about that? I wanna ask you a second question. What types of diversity characteristics should be in the rules? Should policymakers prioritize? So is it someone's ethnicity that's going to help add different perspectives in the room? Or maybe it's their experience. Maybe it's their age. Maybe we actually want to encourage more people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. Maybe we actually think, you know what, what actually is relevant is having employees sit on the board, not just having uh, directors who come from uh, uh, you know, uh, elite schools. What types of characteristics do we think are actually most important for making better decisions. And finally, what types of reasons do you think should be used to justify having more diverse boards? You might advance reasons that we could call instrumental. So you might argue that having a more diverse board would make better decisions, right? There's really mixed research. So the research is quite mixed showing that actually more diverse boards don't necessarily do financially better. But you might want to argue that nonetheless. Or you might want to make an intrinsic reason. You might want to say, actually, for reasons pertaining to social justice or pertaining to my own uh, ethical preferences or pertaining to what I think is right, I think that companies should have a more diverse board. There's a number of ways you could do this, but it matters how we justify the rules, not just what the rules are. So instead of my providing comprehensive answers to those three questions, I'm going to leave them as open. I'm going to say, if you want the full answers, uh, come to UCL next year and take the course. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, really appreciated that. Um, now we'll move on um, to Sarah's presentation, um, just so you can find out a bit more about um, applying to the LLM and the LLM program. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you. I'm Sarah Campling. I'm the director of the LLM. I've been the director of the LLM for about five years now. Um, my background is I was a practicing solicitor in law centers, um, charities, campaigning groups. And then I moved to be the course director of a legal practice course for um, also becoming a part-time employment judge and then moving to UCL Laws to direct the Master of Laws. So I've now been at UCL Laws for about five years, and it's my absolute pleasure to support students on the Master of Laws. We have an amazing program, and I'm really proud to tell you all about it. So why do students come and study with us at the uh, UCL? Why do they come and study an LLM? Often, under, uh, your undergraduate studies, you will have done a, um, a normal, what I would call a normal undergraduate degree with compulsory subjects. And the LLM gives you the opportunity to specialise, to choose to study the subjects that you want to choose. So you can um, study subjects like uh, comparative corporate governance, which Jonathan's been telling us about, you can study competition law, environmental law, intellectual property law, a whole range of subjects. You can specialize or you can study for a general LLM. And what do our students do afterwards? Well, some of them become solicitors or barristers or become practitioners in their home countries. And some are already qualified solicitors, barristers and practitioners and are coming to UCL to develop their knowledge further. 
So in the classroom, you'll find a wide range of different people. Um, many of our students know that they want to study for a PhD and that they see coming to UCL to study for the Master of Laws as a stepping stone to study for a PhD. Many want to teach law and we have a programme for, for law teachers, which is an optional extracurricular activity that you can engage with if you want to. Um, many students finish their law degrees and are not really sure what to do next. So the Master of Laws gives you the opportunity to reflect, to think about what path you want to take, to think about whether you want to be a practitioner or an academic or what's next for you at the same time as studying law and spending a very enjoyable year in legal London. And if you look at the academics that will teach you on the course, have a look at the website. The um, work of the academics and their CVs are very impressive. You can see that our, the people that have, will teach you have been, in cut, sorry, have been involved in cutting edge research, have helped to shape government policy, have influenced national and international law and practice. So we have amazing academics that will teach you. And also we're at the heart of legal London. So being in central London means that we have connections with the legal world. If you have no lectures on a Wednesday afternoon, you may want to choose to walk to the Strand and go and observe a hearing in the Royal Courts of Justice. Or you may want to choose to attend um, the UK Supreme Court, go into the building and observe a hearing. The other thing that which is great about UCL LLM is the ethos of the faculty. So students are really supportive of each other. Um, it's a very friendly place. And it's also a very diverse course. So if you look at the students on the course, we have about 300 students on the LLM. And they come from at least 50 different countries from around the world. In the classroom, you will be studying with students from every country that you can imagine from Germany, Colombia, Kenya, Japan, Thailand, Greece, Ghana, every country you can imagine will be, students from every country will be with you in the classroom. And the Master of Laws itself. Well, as you probably know already, if you want to apply for, a, if you want to study for a specialism, you need to apply for that specialism. And there are 14 different specialisms on the LLM. So they include areas such as intellectual property law, um, environmental law, corporate law, human rights, international law. Have a look at the website at the different specialisms. And also look at the massive range of modules. So the modules for next year have not yet been approved, but you can see the modules that we're teaching this year. You can see that there are about 50 different modules. And again, they cover a vast area. So we have modules ranging from cross-border merger and acquisitions to decolonizing the law, human rights at work, international commercial law to international humanitarian law, judicial review to company law, children and their rights, banking law, huge variety of modules. And as well as the taught modules, and most students will do four, three times 45 credit taught modules or a combination of half modules. As well as that, a quarter of your course is a research essay. So again, that gives you the opportunity to lead your own education. You can choose the topic that you write your research essay about, and we will support you with lectures, workshops, and a supervisor in order to write a research essay. The other thing that's special about UCL Master of Laws is that it's a 10 month program. So you will finish the Master of Laws faster than most students on, most, on 12 month programs, which means that you can enter the workplace earlier and that you have the opportunity to apply for internships and vacation schemes at law firms over the summer period. We have amazing extracurricular activities. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but you should have a look at the website. 
So, for example, we have a very uh, popular academic legal writing course where, uh, which runs over two terms, where students are taught about, obviously, legal writing, reading, how to write essays, note taking, exam preparation, very popular course. Then there's Law Without Walls, opportunity to work internationally with students from other countries. If you're interested in writing academic journal articles, we have our own journal. Um, we have shortly uh, my colleague who's going to talk to you about the Centre for Access to Justice. We have the Public International Law Pro Bono Project and we have lectures. Um, in the faculty, we frequently have events and lectures online and in person. Uh, you may want to get involved in the Graduate Law Society, you may want to run for election. Uh, the Society arranges all sorts of events, uh, careers events and social events. And whilst we're on the subject of careers, we are particularly lucky in the uh, UCL Laws in that we have a dedicated Laws Careers Consultant, who's Stephen German, and he provides support to UCL Laws students. So he's a specialist in legal careers and he provides all sorts of opportunities such as uh, practice interviews, for example. So applications, when is the deadline for applications? Well, it's uh, the deadline is the 31st of March 2022, but we suggest and encourage you to apply early. When you apply, you should complete not only the application form, but also a piece of written work. And that written work needs to be 750 words long or up to 750 words long on a topic of contemporary relevance in your area of legal interest. And as well as your written work, you need to provide us with one referee because when determining who to offer a place to, we will look at your written work, your reference and your application form, including your personal statement. But what are our entry requirements? Well, firstly, we're looking for a good 2-1. What does that mean? It means an average of 65% or above across all years of study or the international equivalent to that. If you haven't quite got an average of 65% and above, and we have places to get places available, we will look to see whether we can offer you a place depending on your motivation, analytical and reasoning ability and your communication skills which we will assess by reading your written work and your personal statement. And of course, we'll also look at your reference. So what should I write on my personal statement on the application form? So we'd like to hear from you as to why you'd like to study law at graduate level as opposed to undergraduate level. So we expect you to know the difference between studying law at undergraduate level and postgraduate level and why you'd like to study particularly at UCL Laws. We'd also like to hear from you about your background and how your background is relevant to the LLM that you want to study. We want to hear from you about your future and how you think the graduate, the graduate study that's studying for an LLM will help your professional ambitions. We'd like also to hear from you about the taught modules that you're interested in studying. Obviously, we won't keep you to the taught modules that you talk about on your application form, but we'd like to ensure that you've engaged with the types of modules that the university offer. If you have chosen a particular specialism, we'd like to know why. And we'd also like to know the field that you're considering exploring in your research essay what you're considering writing and researching about independently to show that you've given consideration to those things. Uh, these are some of the places where our students have gone on to work. Um, we, as I say, we have a wide variety of students who go on to do all sorts of different things. Some go on to be practitioners, some go on to be policy workers, 
some to do PhDs, huge variety. If you have questions about the programme that we don't answer at the end, we have an amazing postgraduate tour admissions team. Um, they are really helpful. And so if we are unable to answer your questions today, then please, after the session, do email or phone the postgraduate tour admissions team. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I think you'll get the opportunity to ask me some questions um, after Rachel has given a presentation on um, access, the Centre for Access to Justice. So I'd like to introduce you to Rachel Knowles, who is from the Centre of Access to Justice, who will tell you about some of the extracurricular activities that you could get involved in if you join us here at UCL. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Sarah. Um, sorry, I'm just going to share my screen, she says optimistically. Um, okay. All right. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, I'm just going to try and give you a whistle stop tour of the Centre for Access to Justice as quickly as I can. Um, so the Centre, uh, first of all, I, I guess the question is really, uh, what's the Centre for Access to Justice and also what's pro bono and why should you do it? Um, first of all, I'm going to ask the question, what's pro bono and why should you do it? Um, pro bono traditionally means for the public good um, and you might think of pro bono as lawyers providing legal advice for free. Um, at the Centre for Access to Justice we kind of look at it at a bit of a broader approach and it can include providing free legal advice but also public legal education, widening participation activities, research, working with national and international charities. We have lots of partners that we work with as well. Um, so lots of different types of opportunities for students to get involved in um, kind of relevant legal work that might uh, increase their experience but also help the community in some way. Um, so doing pro bono, there are lots of good reasons to do pro bono, um, not least because you get relevant experience for your kind of future career development, but you're also in a really amazing place in, in your careers where you can make a difference to the community around you and to people who don't have the legal knowledge um, that they need to uh, make good their rights and entitlements. So um, in London in particular, there's a huge amount of need for free legal advice. And um, with the cuts to legal aid that have taken place in the UK, um, there's kind of more need for pro bono advice than ever before. Um, it also gives you an opportunity as law students to put um, the reality of some of the things you're learning in theory into practice and to understand how um, kind of the law the way law intersects with politics and societal issues and also develop lots of really relevant skills for your future careers um the what's the center for access to justice so we're a teaching and learning unit within the faculty of laws and we were launched in 2013 our key mission is to promote access to justice through research led and teaching activities we have three kind of key arms the first is student engagement and opportunities so we have a a really big pro bono program, um, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. Um, but we have lots of different types of activities. We have uh, activities which we do in partnership with external organizations. Um, we have activities that we run ourselves from the Center for Access to Justice. And we also have uh, student led activities, which are kind of student pro bono um, activities, which are run by a committee of students. Um, we also run events. Um, uh, relating to pro bono issue, or kind of pro bono activities or uh, public interest careers, sort of all sorts of things that might be relevant to access to justice. And we also have a student pro bono committee who we work with together um, to advise us generally on what students might be interested in and also to promote student awareness of access to justice issues. Um, we have a teaching program. We have on the LLM, we uh, teach a module called Access to Justice in Theory and Practice. Um, and we also have a legal advice clinic out in Stratford, which is called UCL ILAC, and I'll tell you a bit more about that as well. Um, I'm not going to read you all of our aims and objectives and what we do, but you can kind of see we have a very broad range of aims and lots of different activities that we do separately, which I've already mentioned in part. Um, so in terms of talking about student engagement opportunities, uh, we have lots of different projects. Um, I mean, this year, to give you some examples, we've got uh, 
people working in various advice agencies like a CAB um, or at our, uh, the University of London Refugee Law Clinic. We are running a therapeutic advocacy project, which is um, based at a school and the students will be working in partnerships with psychotherapists and social workers and teachers to deliver support to families of children who need at the school. Um, kind of extra support in the school and working with local authority social services team to try and help those families access that support. Um, we have public legal education projects such as our grassroots project where we deliver workshops in schools about human rights issues. Um, so there's just a few I can think of at the top of my head, but we have about 20 projects roughly running this year for students to get involved with. Oh, we're also doing some research with justice. Um, so there's sort of research projects as well. Um, we add projects throughout the year and we also allow students to have the opportunity to put forward a, a proposal of a project that they want to run themselves and if it's viable we'll try and support you to run that project. Um, we've talked about events already, we run relevant events around, especially around public interest careers as well, we try and make people aware of the of career alternatives to the big city for those of you who might be interested in that. Um, and the pro bono committee I've already talked to you about a bit as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you guys about, which I think is, well, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I sort of set most of this up, but I think it's a pretty cool legal advice clinic. Um, we set up a legal advice clinic in Stratford, which is um, close to where uh, the UCL East, which is going to be an additional campus for UCL is going to be based. Um, we're in the heart of the community in Stratford on Romford Road and um, we provide legal advice and representation on both a pro bono and legally aided basis. We are the only university in the moment um, in the whole of the UK that has a legal aid contract so we're able to provide a full service to clients and also give students the exposure to working on legal aid matters and understanding how legal aid works in the UK. Um, we provide advice in basically in social welfare law, which is welfare benefits, housing, education law, community care law. Um, and we have, we provide full case work. So unlike a lot of other university legal clinics, we represent clients from the beginning to the end of their case. Um, we represent them at tribunal if we need. Uh, we are able to instruct barristers to litigate on cases if we need to. Um, so it's a kind of broad range of really exciting acti activities and work that we can do out at the clinic. Um, and yes, as you can see, we take on quite a lot of clients and cases each year whenever we're able to. Um, I hope that that's given you some insight into our pro bono work. I would say that even if you're interested in uh, careers that don't involve social welfare law, it's still really interesting and useful to do pro bono work and it will um, give you a lot of insight into kind of a different world and might be something that you take with you no matter where you go in your career. Um, and I'd obviously be very happy to answer any questions you have about this. I will now hand back to Jamie, I think, for all questions. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, you can go ahead and um, stop sharing your screen now as well. Yeah, lovely. Um, actually, Rachel, I'm going to put you right back on the spot. Um, so we have had quite a few questions come through. Um, a lot of questions about um, applications, written work, personal statement, which we'll get to. Um, but one has just come in um, about the CAD. So I thought, why don't we just start with that, um, if you're happy with that, Rachel. Um, so this is from one of our attendees. They've asked, what assistance can international students oriented in a different legal system render for the CAD? Um, I've always been interested in pro bono work. Thank you. The legal system that you were trained in does not matter for the purposes of pro bono. The fact that you've got the ability to think um, with a sort of legal brain and um, use your kind of the skills that you've learned in your legal degree, it doesn't really matter um, what legal system you've come from. You'll be trained, you know, that even students who are trained in the UK legal system will not have huge amounts of knowledge for using it in practice the areas of law that you'd practice in and pro bono work might be very different to what you learn in your undergraduate degree so really the thing is just to you, you'll be trained in whatever you need to know so you can do all the same activities as everybody else um, we have lots and lots of international students doing all of our pro bono work excellent thank you so much rachel um great i think we'll um go ahead and get on to the bulk of the um questions that have come through um through the q a chat now um so if you um again have a look if there's anything that you want to ask that you haven't put there yet if you click on the q a button um on the screen you can add your question there 
Um, so Sarah, very sorry, the first few questions are going to be a bit um, concentrated for you because we've had a lot of different questions about um, the application, um, again, uh, written work and personal statement. Um, and I think you covered quite a bit in your, in your presentation. Um, but I think just to start us off, if you're happy again um, to maybe just summarize a couple of key points about what makes an ap excellent application to start with. Okay, so what we're looking for in your application, there are two aspects to your application. There are the written, there's the written work. And so we're looking for a good solid piece of written work about a subject of contemporary relevance in your area of legal interest. We're looking for a clear introduction, a clear conclusion, and a, um, an opinion, a, a, a view about an area of legal interest doesn't have to be super complicated, but does have to um, go in a direction. It needs to explain to us your views of a particular legal area. So we're also looking in your personal statement for interest and enthusiasm relating to the LLM programme. We're looking to see whether you have engaged with the modules and the legal area that you want to study, that you've thought about what you want to study and why you want to study it and why you want to be a postgraduate student at UCL. And we're looking at that content to decide whether you have shown evidence of motivation to study and also analytical and reasoning ability and good written communication skills. So that's what we're looking for in your personal statement and your written work. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, a couple of uh, quite specific questions around the written work. Um, can the written work component of the LLM application be work that was previously submitted at the applicant's current university? Um, no, we wouldn't really expect you to submit the same piece of written work that you've already submitted for a, um, for a university assessment. The piece of written work that you submit has, should be no longer than 750 words. And I would imagine that most work that you've submitted at a university for, would be longer than that. Um, and we would expect you to um, follow our directions and we would expect you to do a specific piece of work for our application and not just to send us one of your pieces of work that you've already submitted. Could be on the same topic though. You may have written something very interesting about a very inspiring topic, but not the same piece of work. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, and then a last question around this area. Um, just some again, sort of general questions around the written work. Um, is there any type of referencing that should be used? Um, does it need to be on a recent development in a legal area? Um, and is the focus sort of the language skills, um, the topic or both? OK, so in terms of referencing, we leave this up to you. OK, so this is um, an assessment of your ability to write a piece of written work. But you need to also decide whether or not you're going to provide referencing. And if you are, what type of referencing uh, system that you want to use. So we leave this to you to decide. And that's one of the things that we might take into account when we're looking at the piece of work as a whole. Um, and the topic is enti also entirely up to you. So you choose something that you are interested in, um, but notice the instructions. We're not going to tell you what to do. This is a postgraduate course, and this is part of the development of your independent study and your independent work. We're not going to tell you exactly what to write about. But if you look at the instructions that we have told you, it says on a topic of contemporary relevance in your area of legal interest. So it's of contemporary re relevance. I think that might give you a clue as to what we're expecting in terms of how up to date it should be. And we're looking mostly at your communication skills, um, your reasoning ability, your analytical ability, rather than your knowledge of the law itself. So we're looking at your ability to argue a point, to describe something, a piece of law, but not just to describe it, but to say what you think about it. Um, 
we're not testing your knowledge of the law then. Thanks, Jeremy. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and then we've had a question as well around the personal statement, but I thought it might be nice, Perry, if you can remember back to your application, perhaps you can give um, a bit of um, information about your personal statement. Um, this question was, um, do you want our personal statement to focus uh, more on our passion for a particular legal area or talk about our professional experiences? Can the CV be enough for covering our professional experience? Um, so I don't know if Perry, if you want to sort of talk a bit about how you structured your personal statement. Um, okay, so 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 how I structured mine because uh, my CV um, my CV had um, like a bit of information about um, what um, setting like my most of my my interests were and professional experience. So I did um, focus my personal um, statement to try to um, um, communicate to the admissions um, board like my interest like what um, was the starting point of my interest in pursuing a law degree um so i did that and then also i'm um, just um chipped in um like certain other things i've done like along the way to sort of like build or develop myself in that regard and then like my future goals what i hope um, i'm going to like achieve with this um with um, the llm so that was basically um how i structured i left so many um I did not fill my personal statement with so many details as should um, and can be communicated in the CV because you're submitting both. So I think you should just use it to try to communicate since that's sort of like um, the only medium you have to communicate with um, the admissions officer. Great, thank you, Perry. Um, and Sarah, one last panicked question from somebody who's already applied. Um, so they've already submitted their personal statement, but they didn't mention all the points that you um, pointed out in your application. Is that going to weaken their application? We don't tick off the points. We, look at, we review the personal statement as a whole. So we look at the personal statement as a whole, together with the piece of written work as a whole, together with their um, academic achievement and their reference and we review everything so I would not worry too much. Thanks Sarah. Um, we do have quite a few other questions around the application um, process which I'll come back to in a bit um, but just to kind of shift focus um, for another topic probably something that's um, on everyone's mind. Um, one attendee has asked is it likely that we'll do online learning? coronavirus becomes an increasing concern next year. Um, so at this point, we, we can't really confirm um, teaching plans for next year. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to sort of say anything about that in the first instance. And then I thought it might be helpful to hear from our academics and from Perry as well about how teaching has been going this year, um, how it was in the pandemic year as well. Um, and we can at least kind of speak to how teaching is ongoing for the moment. Now, unfortunately, we don't know. If you can tell us what's going to happen next year with the pandemic, that would be really useful to know. And then we can, it would help with our planning. Um, we don't know how we're going to be delivering next year. We hope that we're going to be delivering face to face. This year, we've delivered a combination of face to face, hybrid, online. Um, most of the classes have been in the classroom. We'll ask, perhaps we could ask Perry to talk about her experiences this year. The year before last, the course was online. So all I can say is that we are really good, that UCL Law's academics are really good teachers. And the feedback when the course was online was absolutely excellent. Some students preferred it. Um, so I would say don't worry. The court, we can't tell exactly what's going to happen, we can't predict the future, but whether the course is delivered online or face to face, you will have a good teaching and learning experience at UCL. But Stephen will probably talk more about um, the plans for next year. <laughs> Yeah, Stephen, I feel like, can you cover three academic years of um, information in your response? So perhaps you can speak about um, 2020, 2021, that was fully, pretty much fully online, this year, which is a bit hybrid. Um, and yeah, any, any gossip on the ground about next year? I think the most important thing to remember in all of this is that what we want for you is for you to have an exceptional educational experience. And actually that, can happen whether it's in person or online or hybrid um, and that is what drives 
everything that we do. So, you know, the, the years that Jamie's talking about, the first year where COVID hit, we'd been in person for term one, moved to online in term two. The following year, we were online for the whole year. This year, we've been in person uh, for this term. Um, and um, I think one of the really nice things is our ability just to switch when we need to, when, when the data suggests to us that it's the most sensible thing to be online rather to be in person. And you know, this question you're asking of us here at UCL, it's not like we're the only university where this is a relevant thing. So wherever you're thinking of applying to, it's not going to be, I don't think, you'll have one university where everything's in person and all the other universities are online because this would really suggest a lack of a risk, a risk averse proportionary approach to this university. So my advice to you is, I know it's a relevant consideration, but actually focus more on what you really want to study, focus on where you want to be and have some faith that as one of the best law schools in the country and in the world, that we'll get this right for you. We will, we will do everything we can to make this an exceptional educational experience. The joy of this master's program is that we just have phenomenal students from all over the world every single year and we come together as a community to engage in really complex, challenging, interesting legal questions. And sometimes that's online because of the pandemic, uh, but it's been in person more recently. Whatever happens next September, it'll be great. So just have that and have some faith in us, I think. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and Perry, yeah, I don't know if you're happy to sort of, I think from your um, module selections, you probably have a mix of some online learning and some face-to-face -face learning. Um, yeah, just practically how you found that this year um, and what your experience has been like. Um, okay, so I do um, have some um, online um, courses, um, which have actually um, been really nice. Actually, I wasn't um, expecting to um, get the benefits I actually did get from it because I felt like it being online is going to take away that um, personal touch. But it's actually been amazing. Um, and then for most of the courses that um, taken online, um, the students in the um, course have been divided into smaller tutorial groups, which make it possible for us to come in person. So there's still that personal element and personal um, touch. And then also there are like other smaller groups, um, like the study groups, um, the body scheme, which is like a mix of um, um, common law students and civil law, um, um, students from civil law jurisdiction. So um, yes, some of the courses have been online, but the quality of learning has is unmatched actually. And then the other um, the other steps that the uh, faculty take to ensure that we get that total experience, we're learning and then we're also communicating with our peers is, has actually been amazing thus far. Excellent, thanks Perry. Um, great, um, just moving on then to um, a few other questions kind of back on the application process. Um, Perry just mentioned this in her response actually, but Sarah, you can speak to this as well. Um, this, um, applicant wondered if we accept students from a civil law background. Absolutely. Yes, uh, we accept students from civil law and common law backgrounds. Um, if you're from civil law country, we have a little introductory lecture in our induction for students from uh, civil law backgrounds. We also have introduced a couple of years ago a buddy scheme where we buddy up uh, students from civil law countries to, with students from common law countries so that they can get the opportunity to discuss informally outside the classroom the difference in their different jurisdictions. So yes, the answer is yes, definitely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and another question about um, references for the application. So this is someone who would be joining the LLM as a mature student, so they don't have any current academic references. Um, do we have any suggestions about who they should use as alternatives? Mm, that's a really tricky one. Um, it's good to have an academic reference as long as it's not really, really old, but it, it is good to have an academic reference if you can get one. Otherwise, somebody that knows something about your writing skills and your research skills. So probably a work reference would be um, OK, not as great as an academic one, but it would be OK. But you would want to make sure that they spoke about your research skills if you have any, if you've got if they have experience of that and your writing skills. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and then we had a few questions related um, to specialisms and applying to specialisms or the general LLM, um, which I think I can cover um, together. Um, so one attendees asked if it's possible to join the general LLM and then select a specialism later. Um, the way that the program is set up, um, 
it's ideal if you apply to the program that you plan to study. So whether that be the general LLM or a specialism, um, it's best if you can make that decision at the application stage um, because everything else kind of falls into place after that. Um, there is an opportunity um, once you've enrolled, um, but before you finalize your module selections, um, if you do decide that you need to change programs, um, that can be done within the student record system. However, it's just important to note that that can affect your module selections um, and it can delay it sometimes as well. So um, that's why we recommend at this stage to um, apply when you've made that decision. And then that way, when it's time to make your module selections um, later in the summer, closer to starting the program after you've enrolled, then everything is ready for you to go to do that. Um, but if you're still sort of changing things around your specialism or the course that you want to study, um, there, could be, there are implications then for you to choose your modules um, at that time, because you need to be on the correct program to be able to choose your modules. Um, and uh, someone else had asked if there's any limited spaces um, on each one of the specialisms, uh, which there's not. Um, so we don't cap the specialisms. Um, we're looking for kind of an overall um, intake group across the LLM. Um, so you need not worry that any of our specialisms will be capped and that you can't apply to it if it's too full. Um, and yeah, another similar question as well about switching specialisms or taking courses, um, changing things after you arrive. Um, definitely once you've chosen modules, there's um, no opportunity um, to change. So really important that you make that considered decision now. Uh, then moving on um, now to assessments. Um, there was a question from one uh, attendee about whether LLM exams and assessments are open book. Um, so I don't know if maybe uh, Jonathan, since we haven't come to you for a while, maybe you want to talk about your module assessments. Um, Stephen can as well, and maybe Pere, um, you can talk about the assessments that you are um, uh, expecting for this this spring. Um, but yeah, uh, Thanks, speaking Jamie. about assessments uh, on the LLM. So across courses, there's a wide variety of assessments, which is um, great because some are essay based, some are exam based. On my particular courses, uh, many of the corporate courses tend to be three hour exams. Uh, my impression, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is the three hour open book exam format tends to be relatively common. Uh, and these would be uh, you do at home on your computer uh, and you have three hours and it's done. Um, and there's lots of formative opportunities, so formative essays. So for example, right now, my students have done a practice exam, which I then mark and give feedback. And so throughout the year, there's opportunities to be able to find out how you're doing and to practice and to make sure you're, you're comfortable with it. Thanks, Jonathan. And Stephen, um, before you head off as well, not sure if there's anything you want to say in regards to assessments across your modules or across the faculty. Yeah, just to echo John's point about the variety um, and uh, in my own modules, we do a whole range of things. Some are exams, some are kind of open book essays. Uh, in one module, it's a presentation. Uh, in another module, you create an artifact, an output. So it might be a piece of um, narrative short story. It might be a poem, might be a drawing, could be a video, could be a song. There's a real diversity across the faculty. Um, but my advice to you is don't let the assessment drive your choices of your modules. That's the thing that comes at the end. Don't focus on the assessment. Focus on the thing that you want to be in the classroom every week thinking about. Focus on the topics and the issues that you want to be debating with these world leading scholars. The assessment's the assessment. It's the thing that happens at the end of the module. It shouldn't drive your choices. Excellent. Thanks so much, Bo. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. I know at least Jonathan and Stephen need to head off um, uh, for another session. Um, we can extend our Q&A for another 10 minutes or so, um, but of course, if there's any participants um, or there's any other presenters that need to go um, for other meetings, please feel free. But we'll try and get through another another few questions for the next few minutes. So yeah, thank you very much to Stephen and Jonathan, at least. Jamie, I'm very sorry. I also have to go. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much, Rachel. No, I really care. appreciate Bye. your time. Bye. Excellent. So, Perry and Sarah, 
plenty of questions coming your way for the next few minutes. Um, but Perry, um, I know it's a bit early yet um, for to be thinking about assessments probably. Um, well, actually Sarah would argue not. <laughs> Sarah would say it's never too early to be thinking about your assessments um, coming up um, next term. Um, but I don't know if in addition to Stephen and Jonathan's comments, if you want to talk a bit about the module assessments that you'll be taking this year. Um, okay, so um, I do have um, a different, um, I have like a different uh, model assessment. So for um, for one of my models is actually going um, a 48 hour um, open book um, assessment exam. And then another one is three hours. Um, I also do have um, a 3000 word based in 3000 word based essay as an assessment for one of my modules. And then there's also a model I'm taking um, in international commercial litigation. So the assessment is divided. So 80% is gonna be um, a timed exam and then 20% is going to be the summary of a case, um, a particular case. So yeah, those are the different, um, those are the different um, assessments I have. And it's never too early because I think actually the assessments um, will help um, you um, to further and better structure your reading and your planning approach when you are aware of how you're going to be assessed in a particular course and in another. Excellent. Thanks so much, Perry. Um, great. Uh, I wonder if, uh, Sarah, if you'd be happy to answer this question, um, are there any recommended pre-reading books or other materials um, that applicants and offer holders should be thinking about engaging with before they enroll? Um, uh, you should look at uh, the module descriptions. So the module descriptions for next year's modules are not yet available because the modules aren't finally agreed. But if you look at modules for previous years, you will see that there is a section which includes pre-reading. So well worth having a look at uh, the types of modules that you wish to study and have a look at some of the pre-reading that's suggested on the module description pages. Right. And thinking to the end of the course, um, we've also had a few questions about um, career um, prospects and opportunities for students on the LLM, um, what students may go on to do or postgraduate career opportunities, um, if you'd like to maybe comment on that generally. Um, unfortunately, we don't have our careers consultant here today to, to speak in a bit more detail. So with 300 students from 60 different countries around the world, there's a huge variety of things that people do. Some go to be barristers in the UK, some go on to be solicitors in the UK, some go and study PhDs both in the UK and abroad. Oh, some go and qualify in their countries, uh, in their home countries. Some are already qualified. We have some students who come to do a master's because it's a requisite to become a judge. Um, we have some students that want to work in policy work, um, a huge range of different things. Some want to be regulators, um, so huge range. We cannot say what people do. They do all sorts of different things. Our careers um, advisor, our consultant, is an expert in legal careers and legal careers are fast. There's so many different things you can do with a Master of Laws. Um, but he's very good and then we'll have one-to-one -one meetings to discuss with you um, your career objectives and where you want to go. There are also newsletters with uh, vacancies, um, uh, barristers chambers sometimes have sessions on how to apply for pupillage, things like that. Um, there are workshops which he presents and there's been a law fair I think this year where law firms go and talk online this year I think to students so we provide lots of advice to students about careers not sure whether Pere might have been involved with the careers service I'm not sure yes um, there's actually been um, a lot of careers events um, depending on the particular um, route you want to choose if you want to if you're considering um, qualifying maybe as a solicitor or barrister so there has actually been a lot and um, there have also been like opportunities for us to um, have um, to ask questions um, to these law firms. 
um, there has actually been a range of events that particularly um, are very interesting and will help you if, like me, you were not really very sure of what the next step was going to be. So these events, these careers events, um, they are very, um, um, they are a lot and very helpful. And the fact that they also even give you reminders, timelines of certain applications you need to make and also help you generally with um, your formulation of your CV cover letter. So there's actually been um, a lot um, that is going to be very essential considering post-graduate um, 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 academy and postgraduate careers in general. Excellent, thank you both. Um, we've had a question as well um, asking about the average size of classes or seminar groups on the LLM program. Um, as a sort of general re reference, I mean, these can really vary year on year, um, depending on the number of modules that we're running, depending on student selections. Um, there's a handful of our sort of most popular corporate or commercial law modules that can sometimes be upward of 100 students, um, but the majority of the LLM modules can be kind of anywhere between sort of 15 and 40 um, LLM students for um, sort of most of our seminar courses. Um, so again, this can really vary because uh, we can't really predict year on year which uh, module students are going to pick um, and what their choices will be. Um, but we do end up getting quite a range of um, module sizes across across the LLM. Uh, and then Sarah, uh, there's a question as well about would you encourage students studying a specialism to choose modules solely in their field or to try and diversify selection? I love those sorts of questions uh, because it's really up to you. I wouldn't advise students. To, I would advise students to do to study what they're really interested in and what they have a passion for. So if you are um, really interested in the modules which all fall within that specialism area, then choose modules that are all within the specialism area. Different students do different things. So we find some students who will choose the majority of modules in the corporate area, but they might do one half module in human rights out of interest. Other students will decide to focus all of their modules in intellectual property law. Some might decide to do a combination of intellectual property and competition, for example. So it's really up to you. There is no right answer. It's up to you as to what, what area that interests you. But my advice is that people usually do better in studying something that interests them. So go for, read carefully the module descriptions and think about what you can, um, what you want to spend all day reading about. Excellent, thanks Sarah. Um, I think um, being mindful of the time, we'll probably go ahead and wrap up there. Um, we've been able to get to most questions, um, but we may not have been able to answer everything. Um, a couple of very quick sort of last questions that have come through. Um, one was asking whether or not um, the classes that we offer are LLM specific or if they're done together with LLB students. Um, and that's an easy one to answer. They're definitely just LLM students. Um, all of our modules are separate across the two programs um, and they're not linked up. Uh, between the two. Um, and then someone also asked if any of the slides will be provided after the session. Um, so I understand the session is being recorded um, and that should be shared um, with all of the um, everyone who registered for the session as well. So you should be able to go back and watch the presentations again and see the slides. Um, I don't know if um, Perry, before we go, if there's any kind of final bits of advice you'd like to give um, to anyone still on the call today. So um, um, a final advice um, I would give is the fact that um, this is actually um, one of the um, best decisions I've actually made because on the outside, um, you really are not aware of the wide range of support that um, UCL gives to your students, like literally holding your hands every step of the way from how um, you should um, write um, or make your research to certain other areas. So this is actually um, a university that is concerned with your personal professional development and then the 
um, the team of academics are actually, it's, it's actually really mind blowing. The fact that you have to be um, in one-on-one, -on -one, um, in one-on-one -on -one interactions with these amazing individuals. So um, I would just say, um, you just um, continue. Um, you don't really have to stress yourself with um, what is actually going to happen when you start. Focus on completing um, your um, applications. And then just um, take the, when the time comes, no matter whether you're confused as to what you would want to do, um, I'm not sure whether I want to be a solicitor, I'm not sure what I want to do afterwards, I'm not sure, um, don't worry, you'll get to that stage. And then when you get there, um, the faculty always um, is on hand to help you um, to make um, and support um, your decisions. Excellent, thank you so much, Perry. And Sarah, any kind of final words before we head off? I'd like to wish everybody luck with their applications. I enjoy reading them. Um, I hope that you, should you be offered a place at UCL Laws, that you accept it and that you come to study with us really is an amazing institution and um, you won't regret coming to study at UCL Laws. It is fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thanks so much to all of our attendees today. Um, if there's a question um, that you'd asked today that hasn't been answered, of course, please feel free to contact us. Um, our email address is llm-admissions at ucl.ac.uk. You can also find those details on our website. Um, so please don't hesitate to get in touch um, and one of our team members will be very happy um, to get back to you and help you with any questions. Um, so thank you again um, to Sarah and Perry and the rest of our panelists for taking the time today um, to speak to you all. Um, we hope to hear from you all soon. We hope to see your applications soon. Um, wishing you all very successful outcomes on your applications. Um, and please do be in touch if there's anything else that we can help with. Thanks again. And thank you to you, Jamie, for being an absolute excellent host. Thanks, Sarah. Bye all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Perry. Thank you.